and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Coverage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media, and this is our Friday morning episode, and a very special one, uh, really on the back of AUKUS. Australia, UK, and the United States have uh, launched a new security partnership. We're going to be joined from Canberra, Dr. Malcolm Davis, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and Zach Cooper, the American Enterprise Institute uh, in Washington. So it's great to have these gents on at relatively short notice, but uh, as Malcolm Davis just recently tweeted, uh, it's the day after AUKUS uh, and day two starts. So it's quite a new era that we're moving into. Let us bring on our special guest, Dr. Malcolm Davis with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and Zach Cooper from Washington there, the American Enterprise Institute. Gents, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Let me Great just to be here. that around. Um, so Zach, I was gonna start with you. This is obviously massive news here in Australia and uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, the Twitter sphere is literally going off. Um, what's the sort of the resonation, uh, reson uh, how is this resonating, I suppose, in, in Washington and sort of the implications you feel locally there uh, for the US? I think it's getting a huge amount of attention in Washington. I'll tell you, you know, I, I've been paying attention to Australia for a while, as you and Malcolm know, and I have never seen anything that has gotten nearly this level of attention. Even thinking back to when President Obama gave his speech announcing the pivot to Asia back in November, 2011, that was a little different because the speech happened in Canberra. Right, it happened before the Australian Parliament. And so it got a lot of attention here, but the attention really wasn't so much on the US-Australia relationship. And I think now what we're seeing is a lot of debate about the relationship. And, and it helps that you know we had the 70th anniversary, so there was already some lead up uh, in, in the public in the United States about this. But I also think it's just a unique time. Obviously, we've just gotten out of Afghanistan. People are kind of wondering, what's the Biden administration's foreign policy going to look like now? And and this is really the first clear uh, clue about where they're headed. And it is a pretty shocking announcement from, from my standpoint, right? Um, no one saw this coming outside of folks that were in government and, and really a small handful uh, outside that were made aware. So, so this is getting a huge amount of press here. In general, very positive, but I, I know there have been some small hiccups the last 24 hours, which I'm sure we'll get into. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to maybe stay away from that uh, in terms of the, the guy down under, but um, is it around the nuclear subs as well? Because obviously we've got it, that alliance anyway. So the US, UK, the fact that they've just called it AUKUS is a new, or is it really around that nuclear subs deal? It is the nuclear subs deal that's getting yep. all the attention. Um, and I mean, I think from an American standpoint, people are always looking for a demonstration of US commitment to the region. And they're looking to make the promises real. You know, the United States always says that Asia is the priority theater. We're going to rebalance to Asia. We're going to pivot to Asia. You know, China is the biggest challenge that we have. And yet, if you look over the last decade, the US actually hasn't done nearly as much as you would have expected in terms of cooperation with allies and partners on high-end military capabilities. It hasn't done as much as you would have thought on posture changes of where US forces are based and, and you know, where they rotate through. And, and now we're seeing at the same time a major capability change in one of our closest allies in the region um, in cooperation with the United States in the form of nuclear submarines. And at the same time, a huge set of possibilities that this could open up, right? Could open up the possibility that US nuclear submarines could deploy through Australia or their Perth or elsewhere. It could open up uh, the possibility for much closer cooperation on surface vessels. And even today, uh, we already saw Mr. Dutton announced that there is going to be um, some degree of additional uh, cooperation on the air side. He didn't specify exactly what kind of aircraft, but he said all kinds of aircraft, which I take to mean including bombers, which traditionally has not happened. Um, so this is really across the board. It's air, it's naval, you know, it's current systems, it's future systems. And, and I think this has really excited a lot of Americans who'd been looking for some very clear sign that the Biden team was going to be really shifting its resources and attention from Afghanistan to East Asia. And this is the first sign we've seen. 
And uh, thanks, Zach. And I think to you, Malcolm, uh, your initial thoughts on this as well. And there's a different a range of different things, uh, the geopolitical statement that it makes, but also from a military and defence posture for us here in Australia. Just your initial takes on whether you, which way you want to go with that first. But uh, yeah, your initial thoughts when you heard the news. Look, it's it's the most important um, development in Australian defence policy since ANZUS, to put it bluntly. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is really um, elevating Australia's importance and role in the Indo-Pacific region alongside the US and the UK, um, not just because of the nuclear submarines, but because of uh, the broader focus on technology cooperation uh, in all sorts of critical and emerging technologies, which I think many would argue, you know, things like artificial intelligence, quantum technology, uh, autonomous systems, um, space and so forth, are going to be really the true um, deciding technologies in the next war in terms of how they're going to win against an adversary like China. Um, so it's in, in, a, in a technological sense, in a military sense, I mean, I think it really elevates Australia's role. We were always had you know, very advanced forces militarily, but they were small and boutique forces. And this really uh, uh, opens up the possibility for us taking the next steps in terms of having a much more strategic force uh, in the region than we've had in the past. In a geopolitical context, I think it's really critical because not only does it elevate Australia's role alongside the UK and the US, but it acts as an anchor for the US into the Indo-Pacific region. And Zach made the point, about you know, Afghanistan, you know, there was real uncertainty as to what the Biden's administration foreign policy and defense policy stance was. It, you know, it was, was it talking the talk or was it gonna actually walk the walk uh, in the sense of you know, making commitments to allies and, and, and uh, sort of operating in the Indo-Pacific region. I think that AUKUS really makes it clear that the Biden administration is serious about its commitments into the Indo-Pacific region. And that's probably the most important aspect of this is that it strengthens that message to the region that the US is committed to security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. And it also sends a very strong message to Beijing uh, that the US isn't going to walk away from its allies in the Indo-Pacific region. You've got, uh, in addition to AUKUS, you've got OSMIN happening, uh, which is really critical. Um, but you've also got the Quad uh, that's soon to happen uh, in terms of a meeting, and that's vital. So you've got these series of important steps in foreign and defense policy terms that the US and its allies are taking that are really sending a strong message that must be deafening in, in Beijing by now, that the US and its allies are not gonna simply roll over and, and basically watch as, as China asserts itself. And so, so in that sense, both in military technological terms and also in geopolitical terms, this is a watershed. It's the most important defense development since uh, ANZUS. And hence the theatrics around that and the way that it was announced. Um, I, th I think there's a couple of things. How the initial impact on the French as well, they're, they're quite active in the Pacific as well and the current deal, and then maybe back to how this is actually gonna work. It's good to make the announcement, but nuclear powered submarines operating out of Australia, whether it's gonna be the first of its kind in the world, We've not got any nuclear uh, capability here, and it, there's just just the word nuclear uh, garners a lot of reaction, emotional reaction, both even domestically, but also within the region as well. Uh, the impact on the French, the French are obviously not happy, and they're you know from a, a sort of defence and uh, ally perspective, they are an ally. How that impacts, how it impacts on Japan. What, what stands out amongst all of that uh, as well from maybe from you, Zach, on those relationships? Yeah, I think this is the one area where th there's been a little bit of an opportunity missed to, to reach out to the French beforehand. You know, the, the other questions that we're gonna hear a lot about are, are exactly how the nuclear submarines are gonna be fueled and whether it's high or low enriched uranium which is significant proliferation concerns. I have to tell you, I'm not particularly concerned about Australia acquiring nuclear weapons, um, but, but this is the, the other attack line we're gonna hear. I think on France, um, a couple of bottom lines. First, as, as you both know well, um, the French had some opportunities to manage the program better, 
right? And and the reality is the program was not being well managed, and that's how we ended up in this situation. If friends in in Australia had been confident that this program was going well and at costs, and you know that the subs were going to be delivered um, on schedule, then I don't think there would have been any chance that Australia would have made this decision. So, so first we have to acknowledge that the the problems within the program are, I think, what drove Australia to reconsider. Um, I I do think, however, that there should have been more outreach to France earlier in the process. You know, the the line here in Washington is that this wasn't a role for for the United States. This was an Australian decision and yeah. the U S didn't push Australia into this. So to the extent that France is upset, you know, that's something that France and Australia should discuss, not something the U S should get in the middle of, but I got to tell you at the end of the day, we're in the middle of it. Um, and so I think there should have been some concerted outreach, probably not in the last 24 hours, probably, you know, a week or two ago when we were pretty sure that this was going to happen to the French. I, I'm not somebody who believes that we could have, done a quadrilateral deal on submarines with the French. I think the technology is incredibly sensitive. And yes, France is an ally, but the US and the UK already share submarine technology. Um, and so it's it's quite a different thing to add France to that mix. Um, however, there just there had to have been a bit better outreach. And I think we're paying the price now. Um, and I, I can tell you, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about that here in the last eight, 12 hours in Washington, including at the White House. So I, I think they know that they have to do some damage control, not just in France, but possibly in, in the rest of Europe as well. Um, but look, I think at the end of the day, the strategic logic of this makes so much sense. And it's something I've written about for a decade, uh, advocating this, you know, um, Aspie, Andrew Davies has been, you know, very, very thoughtful on this for even longer. Um, th there, there's just a very clear strategic logic for nuclear submarines for Australia. And so I think even though the French are upset, um, the decision was right. May maybe the way we've messaged it hasn't been as, uh, as artful as it could have been. And uh, the Prime Minister did talk about Gates, Malcolm. So maybe the implications here for defence, uh, you mentioned uh, just pre-interview was uh, defence wouldn't mention nuclear prior prior to this. So it's a major change for them. How the program was running and then maybe the timeline uh, of this new program and sort of what's the status or sit rep for this, given this sudden change? Well, I mean, the ludicrous thing from the Canberra perspective was that our strategic environment was already deteriorating back in 2016 yeah. when the, the 2016 white paper came out. And you could make the case that it was already deteriorating, you know, back in 2009. Obviously, things have accelerated under Xi Jinping. Um, but um, we could have made a strong logical case for nuclear submarines as early as certainly 2016, potentially 2009. Um, but as you say, um, nuclear was not to be mentioned uh, at defence. Um, it was a verboten term. And you know, I recall a personal experience when I was working at defence, I was told in no uncertain terms I was never to use the word nuclear or my career would be over. <laughs> it was that sort of mindset. It was, it was almost paranoia. Um, and I think that you know, had we gotten past our hang-ups about nuclear power and the word nuclear, we could have gone to the French um, and said, look, you know, rather than us buying um, essentially a, a submarine hull based on a Barracuda SSN and trying to stick a conventional power plant in it, why don't we just buy Barracuda SSNs? Um, that would have solved a whole lot of problems. Um, but because we had this hang up about nuclear, um, we have walked into this morass that we've created. Okay, and we're now trying to extricate ourselves from. And the way we're doing it is by ultimately getting probably either US Virginia class or UK astute class SSNs. But we've also annoyed the French in the process because we've, <laughs> exactly. we've taken them down. Lost the five path. Years. We've taken them down the path and spent a huge amount of money, achieved very little, and now we've diplomatically annoyed the French. So it, it's the French have mismanaged things as as Zach correctly notes. But we've also contributed to the mess as well. So hopefully there are a lot of lessons learned from this 
that maybe, you know, when we're discussing strategic policy issues, we shouldn't let um, uh, shallow ideas about terminology and uh, things like nuclear get in the way. As you say, no one's considering getting nuclear weapons here. That's not on the agenda. And, you know, as one of the things I was saying yesterday in my many media interviews, the world would have to be a much darker and more dangerous place for us to ever consider that option, okay? Yeah. So we're nowhere near that, and I don't think we'll ever get to that point. What we are getting is nuclear-powered submarines, um, and I think we could have got to that point a lot faster and a lot easier than what we've done it. Um, but here we are. And in terms of how we get to actually deploying those boats, uh, it's going to take a long and torturous process, um, no matter what, how we do it. Um, the one saving grace is that, you know, if we tie into the Virginia class boat, um, there's a manufacturing line, there's a production line in, that's active in the US that we could you know, tap into and start, try to accelerate the process that way. The, the figures I've heard is that we will get the first boat, the first SSN by 2036. But really, strategic circumstances mean we should have that boat a lot sooner. Um, and so maybe we need to have a discussion with the Americans about saying, can we uh, basically have the first two or three boats uh, off your production line and then we build locally the rest rather than waiting until 2036 before we get the first SSM? Yeah, because the, uh, even the French deal was, you know, a crazy timeline. And I think one one thing I did want to cover off is that time frame. So 2036 sounds like a long way away when we think about what the threat landscape is here in the region and specifically Taiwan, it doesn't look like uh, Taiwan's going to hang on until 2036. Um, mm -hmm. You know, most analysts are talking about this decade at least, uh, and then you only have to look at the uh, operations that China is doing uh, around Taiwan. Really, they could go any time, really, at the, at, from what we're seeing. Zach, how does that time frame sit with you, 2036, before this becomes operational in terms of the subs? Yeah, I mean, look, you remember the Collins class replacements were supposed to come online at some point in the 2020s, and then all of a sudden it wasn't the 2020s, and it was the 2030s, and then all of a sudden it was, well, maybe the 2040s. And, you know, so these timelines always have a habit of slipping. I do think there's an opportunity here, which is, so right now the United States produces two Virginia class submarines a year. That is basically all that we have the capacity to build. There's no question, though, that from an American perspective, even just for our American needs, we should be building three a year. That requires a shipyard expansion. Um, there's a big debate in Congress about whether um, in the $3 billion that the Biden team is trying to uh, $3 trillion, sorry, that the Biden team is trying to push through Congress, whether that should include a shipyard expansion. Um, that would make this a lot easier, in which case you, you would open up substantial capacity, which potentially could uh, result in an earlier um, turnout of a couple of Virginia class submarines, if that's what Australia is going to get at the end of the day. So I do think that um, there is some opportunity to look to move the timeline up. Um, and I, I think there's some tough questions for defense on this. So obviously you're spending a lot of money already on um, Collins class re renovations, which are going to be expensive, right? In the billions of dollars. So do you keep those going? I, I think you probably do. Um, how much time does that really give you? I don't know. Um, but I think these are the kinds of assessments that are going to be critical. But as you know, Chris, I mean, realistically, I, I think in the 2030s, certainly we're going to be very stretched um, on undersea capability. It would be really nice to have this capability out there, you know, in the early part of the 2030s, not the latter part, and, and definitely not having to wait until the 2040s. Um, so I do think that timeline is going to be a, a big focus over the next few years. Yeah, that was the one thing that really surprised me from yesterday was the timeline. Uh, you know, we are making this huge decision to get uh, nuclear powered submarines, you know, based on a uh, perception of the, of the rapidly deteriorating threat environment. And yet we're still talking 2036, 2038 to get the first submarine. Uh, I would have thought that the Australian government as part of these discussions would have said, right, we need to find a way to get these subs sometime in this decade. 
uh, and wherever it's by you know, working with the Americans to add an extra production uh, for shipyard so that we can accelerate the process or whether we lease an American submarine or something along the lines of that. But instead, we seem to be constantly stuck in a disconnect between, on the one hand, our strategic perception of a deteriorating strategic environment that's deteriorating very rapidly and the growing threat of a, of a Chinese move against Taiwan sometime this decade versus a very slow, casual, relaxed approach to capability acquisition within defense that, that is not just in terms of the subs, but in everything. And it's, there's this complete disconnect that somehow is not being resolved. And that's got to be resolved. Otherwise, we're going to be in serious, serious trouble. There's, there's two ways. That, well, in fact, the Prime Minister mentioned the relatively benign security environment that Australia has enjoyed over many decades in our region is behind us. So therefore, we're planning in 15 years ahead on how we're going to respond to that. That's how I read it. Hmm. The I suppose one of the under, underlying, we, and we'll come back to the subs uh, domestically, what that means. I hear it's, a you know, in my mind, there's two things going to happen domestically. One, it's good economically, you know, that's that's a massive investment locally in South Australia, Western Australia, and just nationally, you know, defence posture and uh, defence supply chain here locally and sovereign uh, supply chain is going to be boosted by this over the next decade. But then also politically and, you know, there's, we're going to see more protests. There's going to be, you know, the, the environmental and the, the new anti-nuclear movement is going to also going to rise up and we're going to be battling with that. So, from a corporate security perspective, uh, you know, those corporations will need to be on notice for that. But behind this nuclear sub is all of the other partnerships. Uh, Malcolm, you mentioned sort of the, the technology aspects. Uh, I thought at least wanted to mention things like the Tomahawk cruise missiles, joint air to surface standoff missiles, long range anti-ship missiles, uh, hypersonic missiles. What's your take on all of that? Malcolm, you mentioned all of this is has been sort of announced previously, but it's all part of a package. Is there anything that does bring that timeline in terms of our national security and defence forward that's suitable? Look, I think the key thing is that we are suddenly realising actually we don't have any long range strike capability. Once we retired to the F one, once we retired the F one elevens in twenty ten, that's it. We lost it, and the F thirty five is as good as it is. It has relatively short legs. So um, we do need to correct that capability gap, and we're trying to do that now with the LORASM, the Long Range Anti Ship Missile, the JASM ER, and now the TLAM. Problem is with all of these systems, and getting into the technical weeds, is they all still are relatively short range against the context of China's expanding anti access and air denial envelope. Um, so the delivery package has to get well within that envelope in order to release the munition to get to the target. Um, and that's a real challenge. And I suppose that's where the hypersonic weapons side of things really comes to the fore. But that's not going to bear fruit uh, for many years yet. Um, so this is the challenge we face is how do we get um, firepower to a target, say, in the South China Sea um, without the delivery system being shot down before it can release its munition? And the, the, the strike capabilities that were announced under AUKUS are an excellent step forward from where we were with Harpoon, uh, but they are still lacking in range compared to the threat that we face in terms of anti-access and error denial and also Chinese long-range um, standoff weapons, the sort of DF-26, uh, DF-17, um, the air launch ballistic missile, all of these capabilities that are coming online in the PLA. So this is a conundrum. How do we how do we get firepower to the target without necessarily penetrating their anti-access and air denial uh, capabilities? One obvious solution. I mean, if if we're getting nuclear submarines, let's go for broke and talk about B twenty one. But would the Americans be prepared to share that with us? That's the key question. If they're prepared to help us get nuclear submarines, maybe they might. Maybe this is a discussion for Osmin either this year or next year, but it certainly could build into AUKUS down the track. And Zach, uh, uh, AUKUS, uh, how much between the US and the UK is being shared or how much does this lift that relationship as well from a defence point of view as well, taking Australia out? But where is the US and the UK in this? Is this quite a big announcement from their perspective as well between you two? 
I don't think it's as big from a technical standpoint because the US and UK already share a huge amount of very sensitive technology, um, including on, on nuclear submarines. So um, that's, it's not as big a change for the US and, um, and UK, but where, where I do think it's really important is it shifts the US-UK relationship from being very focused on a transatlantic approach to being much more global, especially much more focused on an Indo-Pacific approach, which is where both countries are going, right? The US has announced its rebalance a decade ago. The UK is now tilting towards the Indo-Pacific. So, so I think it is a clear sign of politically where the attention is for those two. And I mean, to come back to, to what Malcolm was saying, I think the question he's asking is a good one, right? There are very few defense technologies that are more sensitive than um, nuclear attack submarines. This is this is up there. It is extremely complex, right? It takes a huge amount of training, um, and it is very sensitive, um, especially the quieting technology. So if we can do that together. I, I do think there are going to be questions about whether it's possible to think about things like B twenty one, and and if that's if that's a real option, it would be a very interesting possibility for Australia. Obviously, you know there are going to be cost concerns uh, on both the American side and the Australian side. Um, but what Australia needs, as Malcolm has written about, is it needs the capability to strike at long range and to conduct ISR at very long ranges. And this is exactly what things like nuclear submarines and the B-21 are capable of doing. And one option would be for the US to rotate B-21s or, or other aircraft through Australia. But I think in the long term, Australia is going to need very long range aircraft. And things like Loyal Wingman, the, the unmanned system, you know, that's an interesting option. Um, but B-21 is interesting as well. So I, I think that's certainly a debate I would expect us to be having over the next couple of years. I think this is the other thing. This does underline uh, that trust level and we can build on on this. One, two things I will touch in mind. One is the Darwin port and the situation around that and how that seems to be putting increasing pressure on that particular arrangement. And then the other one is China's capabilities in this as well. And I think this is something that the Australian public may not understand in terms of the China's posture and what they are actually doing. Uh, Malcolm and I briefly pre-interviewed were talking about we need to know know your enemy. What is China doing? Why, why is this so critical to us that uh, apart from our own defence and how a nuclear sub will operate, and naturally it's better, it goes longer, it's quieter, uh, what's China doing in this space as well? Maybe, we'll, we'll, and that might bring us back to the, the Darwin port, but where is China sitting? Maybe Malcolm to you, how do you view China and their capabilities in this? They've got about six nuclear subs already and building more? Uh, I think they've got more, but uh, they're certainly in, in enhancing their nuclear submarines because their nuclear submarines up until recently have been pretty noisy. And as you know, in submarine warfare, silence is golden. Um, but certainly the, the Type 93, 093B enhanced Shang and the potential the Type 95, which is the, the next generation SSN, uh, will be much closer certainly to the, uh, the Type 95 will be closer to the Virginia class in terms of quiet, early Virginia, in terms of uh, levels of quietness. Um, where the Type 93B is closer to the 688I Los Angeles class in terms of quieting. So they're getting there. They're, they're getting quieter, more effective nuclear submarines. And in terms of operating those submarines, they have the potential then to project those submarines you know, out of the South China Sea uh, through the, the first island chain into the Central uh, Pacific and so forth. At the same time, their conventional boats are obviously able to to be very effective in within that first island chain and within sort of the archipelagic region of Southeast Asia. So it does become very challenging as we watch China not only rapidly build the number of submarines they're building, but also steadily improve their levels of quietness and operational capability and their ability to carry long range missile systems. Um, it's, it's becoming more threatening. 
Um, I, I mean, sort of, I think the key uncertainty is just how well trained the PLA Navy is in terms of submarine operations. Uh, the US Navy has had decades and decades of, of nuclear submarines operations, so they're, they're par excellence. Whereas the PLA Navy are just starting to understand this, you know, now that they're starting to get halfway decent nuclear submarines, they're starting to understand how to use them. Um, so they've got a ways to go yet, but I wouldn't, you know, underestimate them. They could very quickly catch up in certain areas. Yeah. And it's not just the submarines, of course, it's all the undersea warfare capabilities that go with it in terms of fixed acoustic arrays. The Chinese are investing a lot in undermanned underwater vehicles uh, that, you know, are, are potentially, you know, uh, going to challenge us. And their anti-submarine warfare capabilities are making, you know, sort of headway progress uh, that far beyond what we expected they would several years back when it was pretty pitiful for the Chinese ASW. So, yeah, they are an adversary that, that's coming along in, in submarine warfare. Plus, they've been uh, laying undersea cables as well uh, around the 8 dash line and across the, the, the seabed as well. So, again, you're going to have to be deadly quiet through their... Uh, otherwise, they definitely pick you up. Zach, how do you see China's military capability? You know, they, they have disclosed their plans in terms of to reach the size of the US by 2035 or thereabouts um, and to be and sort of have that capability to, to win a war should they go into it. How do you view that? And how does uplifting Australia's defence uh, in the region assist that? So, yeah, where do, where do you put the two together, US versus China? should it come forward in the next decade and their, their capability and speed of growth uh, in their capability as well? Yeah, I, I think the first thing I would say is, for me, this deal is really about protecting Australia um, and protecting Australia's strategic approaches. Um, and could these capabilities be useful for the United States if we as allies are in a larger contingency? Of course. But I think these are capabilities that Australia needs independent of anything involving the United States. You know, there's going to be a lot of talk about, oh, Australia's just getting this because of Taiwan or something of that sort. No, right? You know, this is a capability that helps Australia, as do the other strike capabilities, independent of cooperation with the United States, right? Yeah. Just in protecting from um, potential adversary submarines or surface ships approaching Australia. And that is increasingly important. Um, so, so I think the first thing to say is this is good for Australia in my view, regardless of, of whether Australia is interested in you know, other possible contingencies. Now, does this potentially help from a US standpoint if there is a larger contingency? Of course. Um, we have a very significant edge under sea in terms of our uh, nuclear attack submarines compared to the Chinese. The problem is we have a very significant disadvantage in terms of the number of submarines that we're going to field um, and the number of submarines that will be in theater at any one time. And so anything that we can do to increase those numbers is going to be really critical. And right now that means you know the US working closely with Japan which obviously fields some very good diesel electric submarines. Um, but if, if in the future we're talking not just about a couple of Collins class boats potentially being available, but some nuclear boats as well, that will matter. Um, even if those boats are staying closer to Australia, that also just takes away a mission that American forces might otherwise be doing, right? Um, and so it frees us up to do other things potentially a little bit closer to China. So I think from an American standpoint, um, this is good for Australia. It's good for the United States. Um, you know, that I do find it sort of funny that the Chinese are complaining about um, Australia's acquisition of nuclear powered submarines being destabilizing when China has been churning out submarines, including nuclear powered submarines for years. And apparently they, tended to think that was stabilizing and now this isn't. Um, so, you know, I think you're gonna get all kinds of claims from our friends in Beijing, but my personal view is the the military balance has been um, undergoing pretty rapid change and not to our advantage for several years. Um, so anything we can do to stabilize that is a good thing. The interesting, I think the interesting thing to consider here, uh, hypothetically, is that uh, South Korea has just tested uh, a sea-launched ballistic missile from a conventional boat 
they've made noises about potentially getting nuclear powered submarines. If South Korea gets nuclear submarines, watch Japan get nuclear submarines as well. And then you suddenly have all sorts of potential options for Australia, Japan, and the US to work together on submarine capability that we haven't had before. Uh, and that would be really interesting if Japan were to go down the path of nuclear powered submarines. Um, so just to, just to throw that into the mix. And the relationships with maybe South Korea, I mean, the Korean peninsula at the moment has been pretty active this week. In fact, it's been knocked off the news, normally be uh, headline news this week with uh, the test going on. Uh, the initial reactions from your observations from, say, Japan and uh, and South Korea, we'll come back to the Darwin port uh, as well. Any thoughts on the Darwin port before we go there, Malcolm, and the northern Australian posture that we've got? Look. I, I think the Darwin port deal was was ludicrous from the outset and should never have happened. And under AUKUS, if they don't tear up that agreement and kick Landbridge out, um, they're clearly living in cloud cuckoo land. Um, you know, this is something that needs to happen and happen very fast. You cannot have enhanced um, cooperation between the US and the UK to counter China, whilst at the same time allowing the Chinese government to run Dar the port of Darwin because Landbridge is owned by a Chinese government firm, SOE. Um, so I really do think this, this is a great, an agreement that should be torn up as fast as possible. And then we should look at how we can expand the port of Darwin to support the needs of both, not only the Australian, Royal Australian Navy, but also the US Navy and the UK the Royal Navy in the UK. And um, before we go regional, and Adelaide and South Australia and the nuclear, uh, they had a referendum a few years ago uh, on nuclear as well, uranium and the like. How is this going to impact uh, sort of at the federal federation? Uh, they won't have a choice now. Any initial thoughts on how South Australia will need to deal with this? Uh, yeah, we're going to need to have a serious discussion about not just you know handling nuclear powered vessels, but eventually we are going to need to get to grips with a new civil nuclear industry. I know that the prime minister went bent over backwards yesterday to make it clear that there's no civil nuclear power in this. Um, and you don't necessarily need a civil nuclear industry to support SSNs, the way modern naval reactor technology is based, okay? Having said that, um, nuclear power, for Australia would make it far easier for Australia to meet its obligations under the Paris Accords for climate, dealing with climate change to reduce our carbon emissions dramatically. And the second point is it would make it far more likely that we would have energy security um, in coming decades as our population grows and as our dependence on overseas energy sources becomes more, more risky, particularly in the potential for an adversary to interdict those those energy flows. So to me, it's a no brainer. Uh, we should build civil nuclear power industry in this country on the back of, a of AUKUS um, at, in coming decades. Not immediately, let the dust settle a bit, but eventually let's have a, a serious discussion about it. And part of that would be how states like South Australia and Western Australia manage uh, nuclear vessels. I mean, obviously the SSNs are gonna be likely based at HMAS Stirling. Uh, I believe that port is already um, you know, certified to handle nuclear vessels anyhow. Yeah. The other one is Brisbane. Um, and maybe we should look at developing Brisbane as a, as a port for not only Royal Australian Navy SSNs, but also US Navy SSNs and Royal Navy, US, uh, Royal Navy SSNs. So let's look at a, uh, rather than having all our submarines based on the West Coast, let's look at having East and West Coast basing. Sydney, I think, is a non-starter because Sydney, you know, Garden Island is at capacity. So let's look at building up Brisbane um, as an option. Um, but obviously, we need to have a broader discussion and debate nationally on nuclear power. Well, that's I think that's going to happen regardless. Uh, Zach, yeah, go. Yeah, I, I just want to first stop what Malcolm just said. I, I couldn't agree with him more. I mean... Look, if, if you're going to end up with, say, a, um, you know, nuclear submarines of some sort, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to have them dispersed in terms of location into an East Coast and a West Coast port. Um, and obviously, you know, Perth and Sterling, that's going to be the West Coast option. So, you know, the good news is, 
Darwin, the Darwin situation is going to get figured out somehow, but, but these boats are going to go to Perth, right? I, I, I do think having a second option in Brisbane is, is logistically smart and strategically smart. I mean, Perth is just really far away from some of the yeah. flashpoints. Um, and even with nuclear boats, you're still talking about pretty long transit times. Um, so I think that would be advantageous, not just for Australia, but also for the US. Because one thing I would expect to see here is the US is gonna be looking to Australia more and more as, uh, as a place that we can operate from comfortably, right? Where it's not like the bear bases where you, you kind of have to bring what you need right? We're going to have what we need in Australia because we're operating the same systems that Australia is operating. So if that means that we have to bring a nuclear boat into Perth or maybe into Brisbane in the future um, and do some work on it, we'll be able to do that. That is incredibly important. Um, to say nothing about the possibility of forward stationing, which is something I've advocated, um, or forward deploying um, a, on a rotational cycle. So I think having multiple ports that can service nuclear vessels is going to be really important. It is hard, no, no question. Um, but if you just think about the limited places in Asia that are capable of doing this, um, having one port or ideally two in Australia really changes that game. Yeah. And you've got the Marines in Darwin already, and that's uh, looking like that's going to be expanded uh, as well. And then maybe it comes to the quad, Japan, South Korea, and then our immediate neighbor, Indonesia. Uh, anything falls out between sort of Japan, South Korea, how they are viewing this? Um, I hope they, hopefully they don't feel too left out, do they? My view on this is I don't think the Japanese feel left out at all. Um, what they felt left out by was not getting picked for the submarine deal in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a little bit of their fault too. Um, but um, I think now their view is going to be, okay, Japan doesn't do nuclear submarines, right? So, so there was no Japanese option here. Um, what I think the Japanese will be looking for is, okay, well, if the US is doing a major co-development program or technology sharing program with Australia, where's the major technology sharing program between Japan and the United States? Um, and that, there are a whole bunch of options that, that we could talk about there. Um, but I, I think that's what the Aussie, sorry, that's what the Japanese are going to be looking for from this deal. It's not going to be looking for more cooperation from Australia necessarily. It's going to be asking yeah. the US why we haven't done something similar with them. On the Korean side, you know, Korea's requirements are very different, right? Um, they're dealing much more in the Yellow Sea, um, in the East Sea, sea of Japan. Um, and so the, the questions for them are, they don't really necessarily need that kind of range um, that we're talking about with large nuclear powered submarines. Um, so I think strategically, it wouldn't even really be necessary for them to be involved in a deal like this. But again, I do think you're going to hear them asking, well, what kind of co-development work should we be doing? Yeah. You know, this really sets the bar quite high for our key allies and partners. There's just no one doing this kind of close cooperation outside these three countries at the moment. So I think what you'll hear from, from our closest friends in Asia is a little bit of jealousy. They won't want in on the deal, but they're want, they will want their own deals. Mm. So I take it, given the layers involved in this, in terms of the technology, there will be opportunities. Malcolm, your thoughts on that, and maybe ASEAN, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific's New Zealand's already said, no, you're not coming here yeah. with nuclear subs. How does it change our relationships with others? Uh, well, look, yeah, and, yeah, we've got to remember that AUKUS is not just about nuclear subs, it's about critical and emerging technologies. So, yeah. you know, quantum, AI, autonomous systems, all of these things. So the potential to develop something in parallel with AUKUS with South Korea and Japan uh, would be really interesting where we're sharing and working together on critical and emerging technologies. Obviously the Quad is, is an organization or a, um, a, 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 an initiative that would potentially open up all sorts of opportunities for technology sharing. And there's already a dialogue in the Quad about critical and emerging technologies. So that's something that could be built on. Um, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, um, yes, obviously it's really important we have good relations with Indonesia. Um, 
but the challenge of all of these Southeast Asian states, with perhaps the exception of Singapore, is that they don't have a lot of resources to fund highly capable defence forces. Um, the one that interests me the most, um, apart from Singapore, is Vietnam, because they've got the greatest risk in terms of uh, you know a Chinese threat in the South China Sea, um, and the and and you know the potential to engage with Hanoi in terms of some aspects of technology sharing uh, for maritime surveillance, I think is is really interesting to look at. So you know high altitude UAVs, space capabilities, that sort of thing, um, unmanned surface vehicles, is something that we could look at. Um, but we do face a challenge with uh, with the Indonesians in particular because they are very cl clearly determined to try and sit on their non-aligned fence uh, as, as long as they possibly can um, and not do anything that would anger Beijing. And that's a challenge for us is how do we get them to work with us uh, when you have the, the, the Chinese essentially determinedly pushing further south uh, with their nine dash line and you know, challenging Indonesia's you know, claims to the Natuna Islands. Um, so I think that there's all sorts of opportunities here for, if you like, AUKUS to be a model for other agreements throughout the region that could strengthen the multilateral aspects of a free and open Indo-Pacific and strengthen defence cooperation to counterbalance and deter China. And the Pacific Islands as well. Uh, as I mentioned, the French are out there quite extensively and China obviously is... Uh, looking to expand its influence in the region as well. Um, where, where does the Pacific sit here in how they both treat nuclear subs coming through and how it changes the conversation uh, between, say, the US and China and the Pacific and our relationships in the Pacific? Yeah, you know, I, I didn't actually get to New Zealand. And, Sorry, you know, and go to New Zealand then. Well, there yeah, are. It wasn't a deliberate slight against Wellington, but um, uh, you know, I, I think that they seriously need to review their nuclear stance because yesterday, you know, uh, Jacinda Ardern made that statement, and everyone just shook their heads. Um, you know, we live in a different world from the nineteen eighties. Um, where we are seeing a major challenge from China, including in the Southwest Pacific. And for her to say Australian submarines are not welcome in our waters effectively was just a huge slap in the face. We know that they've got this non-nuclear policy that dates back to the Longy period in the 1980s, but it's outdated. Um, so they really do need to have a serious review of this. Um, or they're just going to fall into irrelevance, which is you know a hard thing to say because they're a key partner in ANZUS, but they we need them by our side, but they're just kind of like doing everything they can to be kind of out of the picture. Um, so in terms of the Pacific Island states, we, we do need to work with them. Um, but once again, the, they are small powers um, with limited resources. And so we need to carefully tune and calibrate any um, cooperation deal um, to meet their needs, not only in terms of their perceptions of climate change as a threat, but also what can they manage with us in terms of security and defence cooperation. And we've also got things like climate change that we've been covering off as well. These other existential threats that are coming in over the top of this, we're dealing with China as one. Uh, there's a whole range of others. And given the time that we might have left, uh, how do you foresee the next sort of 12 to 18 months, Zach, and where this might be heading longer term. Any other surprises out of here? I mean, we've just come out of Kabul and, and Afghanistan. Now we've got uh, AUKUS. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, and we didn't see this coming either. So is there anything else that is in the potential pipeline, maybe with the Quad potentially? You've got Prime Minister uh, Morrison coming to the US for their uh, Tier 1 Quad meetings later this year as well. Yeah, how do, how do you foresee this to potentially change? We're only a day after AUKUS uh, and uh, any any direction that you might think we should be looking towards? Yeah, so I would start by saying, I, I think you're right, you know, the quad is is the next shoe to drop um, here next week. Uh, that, that's gonna get a lot of attention. 
Um, I don't think you're going to see anything as momentous as what we've seen the last 48 hours. Um, but it is going to be the first in-person leaders meeting of the Quad, and this is this is going to be important. Um, and you know, many people for years explain that, oh, look, the Indians won't really cooperate with the Quad, and they, you know, would poo-poo the idea of the Quad really doing anything. And I, I think the Indians are showing they're quite serious now, right? Um, Later on in the fall, I think you'll see the, the White House here release an Indo-Pacific strategy. I think they're going to roll out their description of a China strategy, um, at least in a speech. So you'll start to see them really explaining what they're trying to do. The, the big critique that many of us were going to have is that they, they didn't have specifics, right? Well, you know, now they've given us some specifics and, and they're quite serious. So I wouldn't be shocked to see more coming. Um, but but maybe not uh, quite of this magnitude. I, I would just say also, I think that there are some really tricky diplomatic parts of this, and Malcolm touched on them. The one that sticks with me is is the Indonesia part, right? You know, the the purpose of having some of these strike capabilities and maritime surveillance capabilities is to largely see things coming through the Indonesian archipelago. And that means that we have to get Jakarta understanding what we're doing. I, I've been strongly in favor of trying to set up a US, Australia, Indonesia trilateral um, to really try and engage the Indonesians. And I think that's more critical now than ever. So the Indonesians not only understand what we're doing, but actually appreciate that some of these capabilities could be helpful for them as well. So I would look for some of those kinds of diplomatic efforts um, over the over the next few years, but look, I I think this is a pretty momentous uh, few days, and and I I doubt we're going to see anything else that quite rises to this level, at least through the end of this year. <laughs> I hope not. It's been it's been a crazy year so far. Malcolm, your thoughts on all of this as well, and moving forward. Uh, look, I, I think uh, Zach summed it up quite nicely. I mean, the quad is is really the next big game in town. I mean, obviously, I'll be watching Osmin quite closely to see what comes out of that. Um, but it's, it's going to struggle to compete with Orkmin uh, in that sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I think that um, the quad is clearly, clearly important and we do need to have uh, a discussion, as Zach mentioned, with the Indonesians and Southeast Asia. Um, but my big hopes are kind of pinned on Japan and how we strengthen that relationship um, in an inside the quad, but also bilaterally and trilaterally. Uh, and I think that's something that, that really we need to be exploring. South Korea also is a factor. Um, you know, I've been having discussions with people from the South Korean embassy on space cooperation between South Korea and Australia. And that's something that we could, we could further develop, um, not only in terms of space, but other critical and emerging technologies. So, you know, there's a lot of ground there diplomatically for us to cover um, and a lot of opportunities. And, you know, we need to make hay while the sun shines. We've got Orkman. Let's ride that wave and actually do some, some things we need to do in the diplomatic defence diplomacy sphere that will really add substance to what we've got now. Malcolm, maybe just closing off, is the dialogue with the Australian public uh we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's a lot of mistrust out there already. We're just, you know, not struggling, but, you know, we're battling to get people vaccinated at this point. Uh, how do you think domestically this will play out as well? There's going to be a lot of pushback. The Greens are pushing back. Labor is a little bit non-committal, like, you know, they'll just watch this space. How do you think publicly uh, this will play out before Look, an election, as we lead yeah. to an election? Uh, I, th I think that increasingly a, a large sector of the Australian population get the strategic uh, environment that we're in. And they understand the challenge from China and they will they will be OK with this. There will always be a portion that kind of are stuck in sort of uh, uh, outdated anti-nuclear mindsets. And, you know, I think Adam Bant, uh, the Greens leader, said yesterday that this is going to be a bunch of floating Chernobyls in Australian cities which is utterly ludicrous. If he knew anything about naval nuclear reactor technology, he wouldn't have made that statement. Um, but that's the sort of mindset. And I think really what we need to do is, is this government needs to now 
make a very good effort on you know, education on what we're getting, on why naval nuclear reactor technology is safe. Uh, there's no radiation spilling around all over the port of Stirling, you know, when we were talking about these things. Um, and make it clear that the advantages, and that's where I go back to my earlier point about a civil nuclear energy program. We need to have that discussion. It's no, it's not good enough for either the prime minister or the leader of the opposition to say there will be no civil nuclear power generation in Australia because you know, relying completely on renewables is not a long-term solution. Um, they're getting better and better in the technology, but they're never going to meet the complete energy demands of the country. Uh, and we can't fall back on fossil fuels. So what's left? We've got nuclear power. Now we have a golden opportunity to push that and say, okay, we're getting nuclear powered submarines. We're gonna need a certain amount of infrastructure to support them. Let's take that next step going forward and get a civil nuclear power. I'll let Zach jump in because he's just about to leave. No, no, and Zach, uh, look, thank you so much. And you do have to go, you're uh, off to your next interview. That's the thing with that being analysts. You're, uh, constantly in demand. So I really do appreciate your time and your valuable insights, Zach. So uh, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks so much. It's great to see you, gentlemen. And uh, what a what a momentous uh, few days. So I'm sure we'll be talking about this for years, uh, but wonderful to get to, to see both of you. And we'll have you back. Thanks again, Zach. Appreciate Thanks, your Michelle. time. And Malcolm, uh, likewise, I'll let Zach go out there. And uh, Malcolm, once again, thank you so much for your time uh, this morning. Uh, and we have, we've gone to the full hour quite easily. Uh, and we've only, I think we covered off most of the, the sort of the context of this. Uh, and now it's really going to get into the detail. So thank you very much, uh, Malcolm Davis there in Canberra with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Good on you, Malcolm. Thank you.